Hi, welcome to my channel. I'm going to try something. The role-playing game I'm developing has become fairly large and complex, and I'm worried that people new to programming might find it difficult to follow along, especially if they're not used to working with classes. So I've decided to try something. I'm going to go back to the beginning of the program and, over the course of the next eight or so videos, introduce the game slowly, methodically, layer by layer. I will also include a detailed index with each video, so if you would like to hear just about one thing, you can go right to that part. I want to be clear about this, though. This is the same game, the same code that I have been developing in my other videos. I haven't changed anything, and I'm not going to. What I'm doing here is finding a different way, a more thorough way of explaining not only my code, but the logic behind the code. That is, I try to explain why I made the decisions that I have. If you prefer it when I just go over the highlights of my programs, let me know and I'll make my videos accordingly. In any case, here's my plan. I'm going to put out eight videos. Each video will build on the previous one. It's my goal, my intention, that by the end of this series, you should have a very good idea of how the basics, the fundamentals of my program work. I want you to be able to go off and use some of the functions, procedures, ideas I've developed in your own games. Hopefully each of these videos will be much shorter than my usual video. I'm going to aim for about 10 minutes. Here are my tentative plans for the next few videos. Of course, things may change depending upon how quickly I can get through each, but I really want to keep each video short. Okay, so the first video, this video, is going to talk about how to construct the background. In other words, I'm going to show how to construct a background layer, in this case, a layer that represents the ocean. In the next video, the second video, I'm going to construct the foreground. And in the case of my program, it's going to be a dock. In other words, something that characters can walk on. In the third video, I'm going to construct obstacles. After the obstacle layer is implemented, the PC will no longer be able to walk off the edges of the pier. Even more importantly, they won't be able to travel off the edge of the visible surface. In the fourth video, we'll implement the player's character. In this video, I introduce the player class and show how to integrate it into the program. In the fifth video, I talk about how to travel from one zone to another. Having a foreground, having an area we can walk around on is great, but we want our playing character to be able to travel to other areas, other zones, but only if they have accomplished everything they needed to do. I do this by implementing what I call the traveling layer. In the sixth video, I'm going to talk about how to implement NPCs. Any digital world would be very lonely, not to mention boring, without any other non-playing characters. In the seventh video, I'll teach the characters how to talk. In other words, the playing character will be able to have a conversation with the non-playing character. In this game, there are two ways a PC can interact with an NPC. The PC can fight the NPC, or the PC can have a conversation with the NPC. In this video, I will implement classes that allow the player's character to have conversations. In the final video, I talk about how to construct a dialogue that handles how to fight. Okay, that's it. Let's dive in. So as I said, in this video, I'm going to talk about the first and most basic thing, how to create the background on which all other graphics will be drawn. By the way, the tiles I'm using have, with perhaps rare exceptions, been downloaded from opengameart.com. Specifically, I'm using tiles developed for the Liberated Pixel Cup. For now, I'm only going to create the bare minimum of classes I need to run the program the Environment class, and the Walkables class. The Walkables class, though, inherits from the Tiles class. In this video, I'll spend some time introducing the Tiles class, since we will use it over and over again throughout this series. Okay, let's start by taking a look at the Environment class. So, the Environment class. This class is going to grow quite large over time, but we're starting out small, with only those object variables we absolutely need in order to run the program. Eventually, though, it will hold object variables for most of the other classes. The only exceptions will be the classes that have to do with either NPCs or the PC. Here is the initialization function for the environment class. Most of the classes in the game require that a zone name and a map name be passed as arguments. In order to understand why this is, let's take a look at the file structure. The zones directory will be filled with information on how to construct each of the zones. Each zone directory is filled with map directories. These directories will have names like map01, map02, map03, and so on. As you can see, at the moment, there is only one zone directory and one map directory. The map directory only contains one file, that of the walkables map. Here's what that looks like. 
Notice that each tile is separated by a semicolon. The tiles that contain three periods represent blank tiles. Also, as we shall see, the row and column numbers will be stripped off, leaving only the tile numbers. The program will match each letter number combination with an entry in the tiles.txt file that I placed in the master files directory. Here's what that looks like. Again, each name, for instance p80, is associated with the name of a file. This will come in handy later. Okay, back to the code. By the way, I've uploaded all my code and data onto my GitHub repo. I've left a link to it in the description below. Now let's look at loading the walkables class. This is the next line in the environment class self walkables equals walkables, and then we have the zone name and the map name. So let's take a look. As you can see, those three lines are the whole class. Obviously, that's because all the heavy lifting is done in the tiles class. So let's take a look at that. And there you go. I've already explained why we need the zone name and map name. All the files of interest are in the map directory, so we need both the zone name and the map name to access them. Now, let's talk about the map kind variable. We need this variable because it will occasionally be important which child class has subclass the tiles class. <laughs> That's a bit of a tongue twister. We set this variable in the following way, self map kind equals self class dot name. After some routine error checking to make sure the zone name and the map name are valid, we call init pygame to initialize the graphics engine. Here's what that looks like. I'm not going to step through this function line by line. I use the same function in all my graphics classes. Remember that if you want a detailed description of any Pygame function, it's available on www.pygame.com. The documentation there is quite good. We are almost finished initializing the tiles class. The last four lines are pretty straightforward, and we will see them again in a moment, so I won't say anything more about them now, but I do want to say a few words about this line. Self inner equals pygame.sprite.group. So, Okay, self inner is the object variable that stores object variables made from the tiles class. And here's what that looks like. In past programs, I implemented this variable as a list and that's fine, that works. But here, since class tile, which we will cover in a moment, is a sprite class, as you can see, it inherits the built-in sprite class. So it is natural to store them in a structure that was designed to store sprites. I think whenever we can take advantage of the built-in functionality of these classes that Pygame has given us, that's a good thing to do because it's going to be much faster for, for one thing and a lot less coding for another. In any case, the Pygame sprite group works more or less the same as a list and it is trivially easy to grab a copy. Just ask for the sprites group and it'll hand you a list of all the sprites. One or two times, you know, that's really convenient, but most of the time it's not needed. Okay, so that's it for class tiles. Now let's look at the class environment driver and explain how data is read in. Right now I'm just going to go and show you the code for how to fill the environment class with data. And that's this code right here. Let's look at the read data function. As you can see from the read data function, the main thing that it does is read in the walkables class. The walkables class, as we saw earlier, it's a subclass of the tiles class. So that's what we're going to examine now, the tiles class and this is what the tiles class looks like. And we're going to specifically be interested here in the read data function and calling the functions read in images and read tiles. So I'll go over what these functions do right now and then we'll step through them. Read in images does what it says. It scoops up the names of the images we're going to need in order to draw this layer and loads those images into memory, storing them in a list named images used. I do it this way to speed up the loading of the images, how much time that takes. The read tiles function looks through the map, in this case map 00 walkables.tab, and reads the relevant data into the walkables class, and here's what that looks like. Now that all the tiles have been added to self inner, we want to display them by drawing them to the screen, so let's look at the main function. Notice the first line, self environment update classes, and then we pass in self all sprites. The background layer never changes, so this layer will not have to be updated, and therefore we call it before we enter the main loop. As you can see, self keep looping was set to true when we initialized the class. When keep looping is set to false, the while loop will exit and the program will end. There are currently two ways in which keep looping can be set to false. To see this, let's look at the handle events function. We can see here that when either the window is clicked closed or the escape key is pressed, then keep looping is set to false and the while loop exits. If the window isn't closed, the program continues executing and the draw function is called. So there's the draw function. 
As you can see, first the screen is filled with the background color, which in this case is pink. Then sprites are drawn to the display, and finally, the display is flipped and everything is presented to the user. Now let's go back to the environment.py module and run it. Okay, it works. By the way, this is supposed to be water. In the next video, which hopefully shouldn't take me too long to make, I will go through how to add structures, in this case a dock, to the game. Okay, I hope that was helpful. Let me know if there was something that wasn't clear or if you'd like to suggest another topic you would like me to cover. Thank you for listening. I really do appreciate it. And well, till the next video, good coding.